Good morning. We welcome you to church this morning on this fabulous, beautiful day. Ask that you would stand and praise with us. There is an endless song that goes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing? Shout praises to the Lord, everyone who serves him. Come and praise his name. From dawn until sunset, the name of the Lord deserves to be praised. God lifts the poor and needy from dust and ashes. Shout praises to the Lord.
Lord, that is our greatest hope, uh, that we could come here today to this place broken, uh, messed up, with a lot of ugliness uh, in our lives, Lord, and that you could take us as we are and begin making us new. That's the hope that you give us in your Son, Jesus Christ. It's why we've come to sing these songs, um, to pray, to hear your word, to fellowship with one another, that we could um, receive this new life that you have for us. God, would you continue your work in each one of us here today, that we will become beautiful, made to look like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. Thanks for coming. Glad to have you. Um, If you're new, if you're visiting, um, welcome. Thank you for coming here this morning. We are glad you're here. We'd love to visit with you um, and uh, and get to know you a little bit. So thank you for being here this morning. Uh, My name is Doug Betts. I'm the youth and children's pastor here. And uh, just a few announcements this morning. I want to, one thing, just point out, um, I've been up here and I've been asking. We have, man, God is doing some, I don't know, in my opinion, pretty awesome things. Uh, especially within the children and, and student ministries. And, um, and so I'm excited about what's going on. But, man, with that comes, I don't know, some obligation or something. I'm not sure. Uh, some more requirements from us. And so as God is working, it's exciting to see the volunteers um, stepping up, stepping out of some comfort zones and doing some awesome things. And one thing that I'm really excited about is, uh, as a, a, I don't know, it was a month ago maybe, a month and a half ago, that I stood up here and we had zero volunteers to work in the child care um, starting that day, and uh, now we're like through January, you guys have responded awesome, so uh, it's good to know that that's being taken care of, and you guys are being obedient, I really appreciate that, there are still needs, um, as we're growing in our our youth and children's ministry in different areas, especially kids church, um, definitely have some needs there, so again, uh, I would encourage you to pray about that, and if you feel led or called, um, I'd love to talk with you, so... uh, Tonight, there will be no young adult small group. We won't be meeting tonight. Most of the folks in that group will be helping um, with the Hay Rack Ride and Bonfire, which is tonight. So junior high through high school students, if you're in that age, Fusion is having a, uh, a Hay Rack Ride and Bonfire tonight starting at 5 o'clock. Um, for those here, we'll meet here at the church at 5 if you want and drive down. It's at Tim Mel's Farm, which is about 10 miles south of here and then 5 miles back west. Uh, I have some maps. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Send me a text. We'll get you directions. But we can meet here and then drive down. That's probably the easiest way to get there. And that'll go from 5 to 8.30 tonight. Um, Christmas wreaths, we're wrapping that up. Those have to be turned in by Wednesday. Um, so there is a table back there in the fellowship hall, which uh, has some of that information. If you'd like to get some of those, catch up with me or one of the students or somebody there. And then uh, this week um, at Clash, Clash is children loving and serving him which is our first through sixth grade uh, kids ministry and that meets every Wednesday from six o'clock to seven this Wednesday we're going to be talking about grace it is by grace that we are saved we'll look at the verse Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 um, this Wednesday and then this Wednesday fusion which is our junior high through high school student ministries meet uh, from 7 to 8 30 this week's going to be I'm kind of excited especially with what Cliff is going to talk about. It's kind of funny how this all, I don't know, God, God works in crazy awesome ways. But we have a, it's called a chat night, and it's just an opportunity to talk, to ask questions, and to just have open discussion. And, uh, and so any junior high, high school students, I would encourage you uh, maybe to be writing down some of those questions as you're thinking throughout um, the next couple days um, to come, and, and you can ask them anonymously. We've got a little chat box that you can put the piece of paper in, and we don't have to know that it comes from you, or you can ask it, you know, however you want. Um, but just to get an open discussion going and, and have some good conversation. So that is this Wednesday with our junior high and high school um, student ministry. And then finally, we have Kids Church, which Kids Church takes place actually right now, um, which is for kids ages kindergarten, grades kindergarten through fourth grade. If, if any of those students are here and want to come up here, you can, and then I'll take you up to the youth room. We'll go up there. We have been, um, we've been going through the Bible I might go up by myself, too. It'll be, it'll be okay. I'll learn something today. Um, we have been going through, uh, we've been going through the Bible, and, and over the last few weeks, we talked about Jesus' death on the cross. Um, we talked about his, woohoo! thanks for bailing me out. You guys are awesome. Uh, we, we talked about his resurrection last week, right? Jesus didn't stay dead. 
he rose, um, and then today we're going to talk about when Jesus meets some disciples uh, on the road, and he starts sharing how the entire Bible, all of the scriptures we have, point to Jesus, and so we're going to talk about that today. Um, anything else, there's lots of things that are going on, exciting, be sure to check out your bulletin, we're going to go learn something, I might learn something, let's go, all right, thank you. What is the big deal about time anyway? This is a time of year when in just a few weeks we'll be having a time change and time is an important topic and a popular topic to talk about. According to Robert Plant, and I quote, what is it that we all believe in and that we cannot see or hear or feel or taste? That's invisible thing that heals all sorrows, reveals all lies, and renews all hopes. What is it that has always been and always will be from whose bosom we all came and to which we all will return? Many call it time, but actually few realize that it's God is the source of all things. To consider God's worth and the truth, God's word and the truth about time, I invite you to listen prayerfully as I read Psalm 46, 10 and 11, which says, he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So what can we learn from these words from Psalm 46? In this passage, God challenges the reader to be still and know that I am God. Busyness can be a barrier to knowing who God really is. Being still and quiet can reveal God to us in ways that we might otherwise miss. So I want to uh, prepare you ahead of time that during our prayer time, I'm going to have at least a, a, a moment of identified silence, a moment of silence, and this is not for silent prayer. This is for silent a time before God to listen to him with our hearts, to be available to receive from him whatever he wants to share with us. The passage goes on to teach that in the stillness, we will realize that God is exalted, that God is almighty, and that God is our fortress. We would do well to pray following these instructions as we pray as a church family. We already have items that were shared in our earlier worship service that we'll include during our prayer time, and we have some items that have been turned in by card and others that have been passed on verbally to the pastoral staff for our prayer time. But we welcome the things that you would share right now for being included in our prayer time, not only joys and concerns, but especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life and the lives of other people. Whatever's on your heart, we want to be able to share together as a church family. What would you share that we could include as a prayer of joy, concern, or testimony? Whatever's on your heart, we welcome the things that you would share. Yes, back there.
Amen. Thank you for sharing, especially being so vulnerable to share about what it was like for you personally. That really encourages the rest of us. So we will pray for you. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies, we welcome the things that are on your heart. God is working. He has worked. He continues to work. Yes, back there. We'll p pray for Robert Kibbe. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute, following a pattern of prayer with the uh, letters of the word pray. P R A Y is an outline in which uh, P reminds us about praise, R reminds us to focus on repenting, A reminds us to ask, and ye, uh, why reminds us to yield. I want to invite you to join me in your hearts as I pray. I'm going to share some suggestions, but uh, I really want you to feel free in your own heart to pray as we're praying together. 
As we start with praise, I uh, invite you to talk to God in your own heart, praising him however he prompts you. We do praise you, God Almighty. You alone are the loving, sovereign God. You are holy. And we pray after the pattern of the psalmist in Psalm 46, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And now for just a few moments, I invite you to be still, to listen, and to think about God and allow him to speak to you with whatever he's sending to your heart. God, you are good. You are our Heavenly Father. You do not change. You alone are eternal, everlasting, and exalted. We praise you with our lives. We lift our hands in your name, and we praise your holy name. As we continue on now in our prayers to a time to focus on repentance, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart about your own life, however he prompts you. Lord, we come to you seeking cleansing and forgiveness. We observe the pattern from Psalm 32 in which uh, the psalmist prayed there. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I have failed, I have sinned, I am hopeless and helpless on my own. I'm guilty. God, I confess my sin and I repent and seek your mercy, washing and cleansing. It's only by the blood of Jesus that we have any hope of forgiveness and cleansing. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. I can't pay it back. It's just by grace. It's a gift and I thank you for that gift. We move on in our prayers to a time to focus on asking. I encourage you to talk to God in your own heart, asking him whatever he prompts you to ask him. Lord, there's many blessings and concerns that we want to bring before you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your court and to share the things that you've laid on our hearts. We give you praise and thanks along with Terry as he shared testimony about your work in his life through the diagnosis of a serious medical concern and then through the surgery and all the related things, the verses that you have spoken to him from Isaiah 41 and Psalm 39, Lord, we give you praise and honor. We thank you for the encouragement to enjoy every moment to not take anything for granted, and we pray that you would continue to be with Terry, to continue to heal and restore him, to protect and keep him, guard him from any complications or difficulties, we pray. We pray along with Phyllis for Robert Kibbe as he still has concerns. Uh, be with him, we pray. We give you praise along with Jared and Morgan Smith for the birth of a little girl, Jordy Lowe, Smith on October 5th, and we thank you that mom and baby are doing well. Bless them, we pray. We praise you, God, with Casey Seifert for the Principal of the Year Award that he received recently. Continue to bless and encourage him and empower him in the influence that he has in the employment with the school. We praise you for the Christ program, for the workers and helpers and students as it continues this fall. We praise you for the Fusion Hayrack ride and bonfire this evening. May many young people be able to benefit from that time of sharing and adventure. 
We continue to pray for Larry Gerard that you would help him in his recovery at home. And we pray along with Jean Nyberg for her brother Paul as he recovers from surgery and other complications. Be with him in all that concerns him. We pray with Michelle Drum for her dad Charles as he continues to recover following heart surgery. Help him, we pray. We pray for Catherine Loofboro and the things that she's experiencing as her health declines. Be with Jill Orsham and her mom, Eileen. For all that concerns each of them, help them, we pray. We pray you'd be with the stewardship team to give them wisdom as they seek to identify a budget that's reasonable uh, for 2018 for our church family. Help us by faith to seek you on that. And we pray for the nominating team as they seek nominees for the 2018 church leadership positions. Be with uh, Doug and Dina Betts as uh, we continue to pray for their house in Bennington to sell soon. Bring a buyer, Lord. Allow them to be released from that uh, responsibility. We want to pray for the families of those who have experienced the passing of loved ones. We pray along with Lisa Novak for the family of her Aunt Martha Hughes and for uh, Richard Tex Mills who both passed away and their funerals were both Friday. Send comfort and peace, we pray. And we pray along with Tori Bowers and her family for the passing of Grandma Dorothy, who uh, passed away last week. Send comfort and peace to that family, we pray. We pray for Pastor Cliff as he shares your word. Fill him, anoint him, use him. Allow him to be a channel of your truth. And may your spirit be present to prompt the heart of each one who hears that we may individually sense your direction on how we can take whatever the next step is for each of us on our spiritual journey. As we move on to another form of prayer, to focus on yielding, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, yielding to him however he prompts you. Think for a moment about the phrase, be still and know God. The meaning from this text from Psalm 46 is that God is defending his city and his people and the Hebrew definition means to stop striving, to let go, to surrender. That whole chapter begins and ends with God as our refuge. In other words, we need to come to a place where we're willing to submit ourselves to God and acknowledge that he is in sovereign control. It may be a matter of finally saying we trust him. This will open the door so that we may experience the fullness of all God wants and has for us. After all, he is our creator and has a perfect plan for us when we let him orchestrate it. Therefore, I yield, I surrender, I give up. I'm still and I know God because I want to serve and submit to God alone. I pray all these things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. I had my uh, words and thoughts all scripted out to move us into our communion time, as I often do, because I don't uh, think very well. I certainly don't speak very well on my feet, but uh, our last uh, praise song this morning, Beautiful Things, just uh, kind of got me thinking in a different direction this morning, and God certainly does make all things new, uh, and it was a costly proposition for God to do that. Uh, I'm reminded in by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that therefore if, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And that is a, a, a wonderful, amazing truth. And like I said, it cost God dearly uh, by sending Jesus to earth to die on the cross for our sins. So if you have uh, professed your need for forgiveness of sin and have yielded your uh, life to Christ, we certainly invite you to join us in communion today as the deacons will... Uh, distribute the elements of the bread and the juice. We would just ask you to hold them until all are served and we'll take them as a family. And before we do that, I'd just like to read the, the words of the prophet Isaiah that God gave him, uh, and they're recorded in chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. And those words are, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do come to you today just recognizing that it is only through you that, that we can become new creations. There's nothing on our own that can make that happen, but uh, we just thank you that out of your grace and mercy that you willingly uh, sent your son Jesus and he willingly and obediently went to the cross to take the penalty we deserve. What an awesome gift, and we just give you thanks for that today. God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would... Uh, just stir our hearts that you would uh, lead us in new ways, that we would be new creations that serve you in ways that we can't even imagine. We just give you all the praise and glory, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. This is the account that is recorded in 1 Corinthians of Jesus with his disciples when they broke bread together, and it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We will now receive our tithes and offerings. God has given generously and makes it possible for us to join him in giving generously as well. Gifts given in gratitude and with a spirit of generosity are pleasing to God. Consider the poor widow whom Jesus points out in Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, come today just thankful for your generosity that you poured out on the cross to us. Lord, it's just amazing that you have uh, given us so much to steward for you. And Lord, I just pray that we would do it wisely and generously. It's not only money that uh, you make available to us to give, but also you bless us with gifts of talents and, and abilities. And Lord, I just pray that we would share those willingly and generously as well. Whatever they may be, Lord, help us to be in prayer to you, discerning how you would move us to share those with, with your kingdom. I just ask it in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. You guys look fantastic. Thank you again for uh, coming out, making the effort to be with us, to worship together. It's a real honor to have you here. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today is a day where we are going to wrap up the uh, sermon series that we've been working through for the last several weeks. Uh, today is the last installment of Parenting Failures and the Hope of the Gospel where we've been trying to encourage you parents and grandparents, as well as everyone, whether you're a parent or not, uh, with some truths from God's word. God's word. Um, and today I want to wrap up by looking at a text from Exodus chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, uh, we encourage you always to follow in your own Bible if you can. We think that's helpful. We'll also have it up on the screen here so you don't miss it. But Exodus chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 21 through 27. And just to give you a little context for this, because we kind of jump into the middle of something uh, with our reading today, uh, the context is that God's people, the Israelites, have been in Egypt for a long time, and over time they have become enslaved. They are used as slave labor. Uh, they are treated really, really harshly. Um, in many cases, they are, uh, their children are sought to be murdered. 
Um, and uh, after a, a period of time, God um, hears the cries of his people, and he is at work to deliver them. And he does that by bringing a series of plagues uh, that he brings on the uh, Egyptians, trying to convince Pharaoh, king of the Egyptians, to let God's people go. And after nine of these plagues, which have been really severe, Pharaoh still is stubbornly saying no. And so God is about to bring a tenth plague, the most terrible of all the plagues, which is God is going to strike dead the firstborn son uh, of all in Egypt. And as God prepares to do this last plague to free his people, he gives instructions to Moses, and Moses now is going to tell the people of Israel what to do on this night called the Passover. This is from Exodus 12, follow along, verses 21 through 27. Remember, this is God's word. And then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. And when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over the door, that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And then the people bowed down and worshipped. Let's take a moment to pray. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence right here in this place. And so we know that as we read your word, Lord, um, that you would speak to us if we would be given ears to hear, if we would open our hearts and our minds. Help us to do that now. And by your power, God, would you feed us from your word so that we can go out and be changed by you. By your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, to <clears throat> just kind of look at this series as a whole again, our, our goal has been, my goal has been, to try to encourage you as parents or as grandparents, uh, whatever stage of life where you are working with children, to try to raise them to know the Lord, to encourage you. And I know it felt a little bit awkward probably because I was calling out specific ways in which we mess up as parents and, and our failures in that way. But what we've tried to say is, this is helpful if we can all just admit that, if we can all kind of get on the same page that there are no perfect parents, that we all recognize it's a pretty scary deal you have a child and the hospital will throw a couple diapers and wipes your way and say, good luck with all that, you know, and then you're, you're kind of set free and then you go and you're like, ah, we don't really know what we're doing, you know, and it's kind of day by day you're trying to figure, sort, sort things out and it's a struggle because, you know, they start out pretty helpless but then as they grow they change and just when you think you're starting to get the hang of it, you know, then they hit another stage of development and then they hate you and you're trying to figure out how did I raise this person who hates me and doesn't want anything to do with me and, and it's really, really, uh, it's a hard thing, it's a struggle. So I want to encourage you that parenting is, I think, the hardest job on the planet. But you're not alone and those of you who have put your faith in Christ, you have a hope of the gospel that's at work in you and through you, not only for your parenting, but also, and this goes again to everyone, whether you're a parent or not, the power of God, who is our good, good Father, who is our perfect Heavenly Father. And His parenting to us um, is perfect. It's never um, uh, without purpose, and it never misses the mark. And there's always hope, so that God can take even our worst mistakes and sins and failures and overcome them. But more than that, the power of the gospel is such that God says, and I will change you. So you don't have to 
be in this despair that you're going to keep repeating the same old cyclical sins in our lives over and over and over again. That God really does progressively, slowly, it seems to us, but it really does happen, change us. And so we learn and we grow from God's parenting of us. So this series is meant to do that, and the essence of this message today is basically this. We fail in lots of ways, but one of the ways that we fail as a parent is we fail to tell our kids that we fail. We fail to confess our failures. We fail to be open about where we have really messed up. And again, I want to expand this and extend this, not just to parents, but this is true of all of us, that one of the struggles that we have as individuals is that we work really, really hard to try to make ourselves look better than we are, that we want to hide the flaws and the imperfections and the sins. We want to hide that as best we can because we don't want our kids certainly to see that, we think, and we certainly don't want other people to see that. But what I want to say this morning is that God is actually freeing us to share those things, that God, in fact, wants to have his love so fill us that we are freed to not worry about our self-image, that we're free to not always be trying to worry about what people will think about us or build ourselves up, but we're, we're actually so filled by his love, we can honestly say, I, I, I did that. Uh, that was my sin. I was wrong. And that freedom to confess. And so there's a, uh, a verse in the Bible in the New Testament where in the uh, writing that James gives us that he says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed that there's a great healing that happens when we're able to be open and honest even about our faults and our failures and our sins. And I drew this text to look at it today um, from this perspective in Exodus. Seems like maybe an odd text to to kind of dive into this, but I want to begin by looking at the interaction that, go back to parents and children here for a second, that God builds between children and their parents that is absolutely essential for this to happen that we're able to share our story of our life, even the messy parts, because God builds into children this natural inquisitiveness, this desire to know, this really kind of asking questions all the time. In fact, in the middle of God telling them the technical details of Passover, hey, from years on down the line, you're going to remember this night. It's going to be a terrible night, but also a night of freedom where you're brought out of slavery. Remember, by doing this Passover meal with the blood over the doorpost and you slaughtered this lamb, and now you eat it as part of a meal together as a family, but you will always remember then. But in the middle of all that, God says, so when you remember to do these things, your kids are going to start asking you questions. Your kids are going to ask you questions and puts it right in the text. When your children ask you, what does the ceremony mean? to you. What does this mean to you, mom? What does this mean to you, dad? Then tell them. In other words, God's saying, I I build this into kids right away. I saw this stat. It must be true. It's on the internet. So anyway, I I saw four-year-olds ask, on average, no kidding, 487 questions a day. 487 questions a day that a four-year-old asks. Some of you are like, that's low-balling it, Cliff. I think it's a little higher than that. And almost all of those 487 questions happen at the worst possible moments. Like, there's a question, but I would love to answer that, except that right now your brother is literally taking every box of cereal off of the shelf at the store, and I, I really can't answer your question right now. The questions come a lot of times at the worst possible moments for us as parents or grandparents, and you want to respond, but it feels like the, the hecticness or the rush of the day, the pressures and the stress really don't make it possible to get into it. And sometimes it's the nature of the question. So kids will ask these, you know, kind of deep questions. You know, why why am I here? Where did I come from? You know, every parent wants to get into that question right away, right? Or why is the sky blue? You know, why do Hobby Lobbies exist? Why do those kinds of mysteries of life happen out there? And so you're like, how do I even begin to get into a question? So sometimes the nature of the question seems like, you know, I don't even know what to tell you. I've heard this um, from child development um, folks that say, you know, when the kid gets into that why stage, so even when you give an answer, and they're like, yeah, but why? 
Uh, yeah, why? Why? I, I just told you why. Why? And you're like, you're just irritating me now. But what they're saying is that kids really aren't trying to say, I'm not impressed with your answer. You're going to have to do better than that. What they're really saying is, I just want more. I want you to tell me more. Because, see, I'm understanding the world and me and you and everything that I experience through you. You're the one who's guiding me, helping me to understand all this, and I, I, want, I want more information, and the, they don't know how to really put it that way, so they just keep saying, why? Tell me more. I, I, I read this kind of this neat thing. Mom, getting this from her kid, I think he was three or four years old, and he was just, why, 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 why? Why is the sky blue? He, he asked her that question. And she said, I realize that he just wants to have a little story, a little conversation. So he, she said, well, you know, it's an interesting thing about the sky. She said, it is blue, like today, she said. But you know what? There are times earlier in the morning or later at night when the sky actually looks orange or red. And there are times when in the middle of the day it doesn't look blue. It looks kind of gray when there's a lot of clouds. And there are times at night when the sky is so dark it's black. Isn't it amazing the different colors that the sky can do? And the kid was like, this is fantastic. And some of you are like, yeah, but you skirted the question. You never answered the question, why is the sky blue? They want to know the story of your experience with it. That's why our text says, when your kid asks you about this ceremony, it's a religious ceremony, you're going to do it as a people year after year after year. And when they ask, they don't just ask, why do you do this? What does this mean? They ask, what does this mean to you, to you personally, Mom, to you, Dad, what's happening there? I think, again, part of the struggle is the time pressures. It's like, I'd love to have a conversation with my kid about that. But it's, it's really difficult to do, Cliff, because we've got to get supper ready, and we've got to run over here, and we've got all these activities that we've got to do, and we're trying to squeeze it in. I just read this, this new statistic just came out. And don't get me wrong, I'm not preaching against technology. I love technology. It's a good thing. It's not all a bad thing. But the screen time that kids under the age of 10, the amount of time that they spend in front of a screen, whether it's a mobile screen or some other device that they have, has gone up now to 2 hours and 19 minutes a day. And, and again, some of you are like, I think that's lowballing it. I, I think my kids are in front of screens more than that. Two hours and 19 minutes every day that they're in front of a screen of some kind. And of course, when they get older than 10, that goes up exponentially. I mean, teenagers have a really, really high rate of usage in their faces in front of a screen. It's interesting. Did you know who uses screen time most? Is not younger kids and it's not teenagers, it's parents. Did you know that parents have more screen time um, for them than they, they, even their own teenagers? I understand that, and it's not a bad thing. You've got to get something done. You put the kid in front of a, here, play this game on this video. But at some point, God is saying, don't miss this opportunity. I actually created your kid with a desire to ask a question to engage you. Among all the people on this planet, they want to come and ask you why. Why did this happen? Why is the sky blue? Well, just Google it. You'll get a better answer than I can give you, right? No, that's our opportunity, God says. So don't miss the opportunity. It's tremendous opportunity and responsibility. I get this too. The way to this, because your kids believe what you say. It's amazing. I can't get people to believe anything I say, but a young, a young child growing up, what mom or dad says, is it's the truth. It's so true, in fact. Uh, these are weird websites, but... There's a website called IUsedToBelieve.com, and it's actually all these adults who now are going back and saying, you know, my dad told me this, and now I just found out as an I'm adult that it's not true. Things like, when I was little, my dad told me that polyester was a small animal in Australia, <laughs> and they would kill it to make clothes. And so that night I sat in my room for hours reading the labels on my clothes and throwing out all of the polyester clothes that I had. Or another one says, when I was younger, my dad told me that if I whistled, it would attract snakes. <laughs> and so I can't even hear a whistle now without getting nervous, this person said. Or one who said, I overheard my dad, this sometimes come back against parents here, I overheard my dad use the word brothel, and I asked him what that was. And he hesitated, and then he told me it was another name for an amusement park. 
And so a year or so later, we went to Florida as a family, and we got on a public shuttle bus, and when we passed Disney World, I shouted, Dad, look, Dad, a brothel. Can we please go? And so you realize, wow, they don't believe anything that you say. Of course, the, the power of this is that I don't want to give them wrong information. Notice these were all dads. I never got any moms that were giving <laughs> misinformation, only the dads. But at some point, you realize God has invested you with this power to be able to transfer the truth. And again, I know some of you are like, Cliff, I don't know, that's not my kids. My kids don't believe anything I say. They don't, they don't trust me. That. Don't misunderestimate or, misunder, or misestimate your, your, your power as an adult to do this because here's the thing, studies still show. I know when they reach adolescence and teenager, you're thinking their peers matter way more to, to them than me. They, they don't care. They could give a rip about me as a parent. And studies still, still show the primary influencer in their life, even in the teenage years, is mom or dad. Still. They may not say it. They may not admit it. But their values are being shaped by you. What their beliefs are being shaped and formed by you. And God says, I did this on purpose. I gave this power, this opportunity and responsibility to you. Now, once you know that, then here comes a powerful opportunity to admit, not just to pass on information, the truth, but the truth about you and the truth about me. That we are able to then speak into the lives and admit that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. One of the things that happens with kids is that they begin to form their development, developmental wise, they look at parents as kind of a picture of God. You, you are God to them. And as they look at you, and they begin to strive to say, I want to please my parents, I want to please dad, I want to please mom, and the weight of that, you're like, wow, that, there's a lot of responsibility there, but at some point, to be able to differentiate for them that you are not God, that you are in fact someone that God has given to them, that you want to love them like God, but in the end, I failed to do that, son, I, I'm not up to that completely, daughter, because I am a sinner like you and like everybody else. Isn't this why it's such tremendous damage when someone is abused by a parent? Because suddenly, and we have people who still struggle, of course, with if their father was abusive, and now as an adult, and they're fully aware, hey, dad was not God, he's not God at all, I understand that, and yet still can't bring themselves to say our heavenly Father, because the connotation of father is so wrapped up in the abuse that they receive that is really, really hard. Doesn't it show that at some point it's incumbent on us as parents to say, I want to point you to God, but you've got to understand something. I am a sinner. I'm not God. Critically important that they begin to hear us say things. I, I, I hear some parents are really exasperated. You ever catch your kid doing something? And you catch them red-handed. I mean, it's not, it's not like you need much more evidence here. I mean, you got videotape, you got hands are red. I mean, everything is there. And they won't admit that they did it. Do you ever have that happen? You're just like, what, what is wrong with you? Everybody sees that it was you. You did this. And they will not admit it. And here's a question. How many times have they heard you admit that you were wrong? Because make no mistake, Kids watch us for a living. In other words, it doesn't matter what we say, but what we do. We've heard that over and over again. Hey, what you do is, makes more of an impact, but that means we have to model for them also, not only the right behavior, but when we mess up and we do it wrong, we have to model for them what it's like to come up and say, I was wrong. I, I did that. And to be able to model this for our kids is a powerful, powerful action, I think, in their life. The world will not give them many examples of that. They won't. You see it in the news all the time. Somebody's caught doing something, and it's just, I have no recollection of doing that. I, I didn't do that. And there's denial, denial, denial. Very rarely do we see somebody who steps up and just flat out says, I did it and I was wrong. And so our kids are needing some kind of example, and from mom and dad is a powerful thing. And I think we're afraid to do this for a number of different reasons. One reason is, I think we're afraid we're going to lose our moral high ground. Cliff, 
I'm trying to teach them wrong and right. If I tell them that I was wrong, that I sinned, am I, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna lose my ability to speak into their life about what is right or wrong because they'll say stuff like, well, you did it. If you did it, well, how are you telling me that it's wrong to do it? I think we're also afraid that we're gonna encourage our kids to actually make the same mistakes that we make. Cliff, if I tell them where I've messed up, isn't that going to pretty much encourage them just go ahead and do it because after all, I guess it turned out okay for you, so I'm going to go ahead and make the same mistake. I think we worry about that, and I think we also worry that somehow it's going to diminish our kids' respect for us. Like if I tell them I'm really messed up and I'm a sinner, and they hear that, that at some point they're going to start losing respect for me. Like they're going to say, wow, I know Pastor Cliff does this all the time, but you really are messed up, you know? Good luck with that, Mom, Dad. I mean, we're afraid we're going to lose. I just read this down in Oklahoma. A little town, Sperry, Oklahoma. I think it's north of Tulsa. A little town smaller than Beloit, just like 1,200 people. And the police chief of Sperry, Oklahoma, posted on the Facebook page for the police department, um, he wrote this. This was interesting. He said, uh, a citizen made a complaint about me, your police chief, speeding. And I acknowledge that I was wrong. I was traveling at about 75 miles per hour in a 50 mile per hour zone. I did have a reason for being in a hurry, but my speeds were not reasonable. And so I'm holding myself accountable just as anyone else would have to be. I've written myself a $300 citation and I'll be paying it just like every other citizen. I regret my actions, and I sincerely apologize. And then there was a TV station that heard of this and went, over to, went up to interview him. And they interviewed him, and they found out that he confessed to it because someone had actually gotten video of him speeding, and they sent it in anonymously to the police department. And so the, the reporter asked the police chief, they said, well, it was really something that you would give yourself a, a ticket for this. Would you have given the ticket if they hadn't sent the video in? And he said, probably not, he said, probably not, to be honest. Now I want to ask you something. Does your respect go up or down for somebody like that? I don't know, when I was reading, I was like, first that he gives himself a ticket, I thought, hey, that's a pretty upstanding guy. And then what really sealed it for me was that when he was asked, he could have said, oh no, I I would have sent that in, I would have given myself a ticket no matter what, but he had the honesty to say, you know what, there's still a part of my heart that still would have tried to hide it. But I got caught, and now I'm not going to try to hide it anymore. I think your respect goes up. Your kids begin to look at you and say, they're not trying to use me. They're not trying to pretend they're better than they are. Mom and dad are able to share with me when they also mess up. By the way, let's get some balance here, okay? I'm not trying to say that your kids become your therapists. I'm not trying to say take your deepest, darkest secrets and dump it on your kids because it's a burden that they were not meant to carry. But I am talking about the kinds of ways in which we as parents, we catch them and we want to hold them accountable, but the slightest thing on our part, we want to excuse away. How different would it be for our kids when we say, hey, I just want to tell you something. I was too harsh with you. I came home, I was kind of frustrated from work, I was, and, and when I had to discipline you, I'm going to tell you, I had more than just loving discipline. I had a lot of anger in there, and I went over the top, and I'm sorry for that. You're still grounded, but I'm just telling you, the honest part of it, there's a part of that that wasn't good in there, and I I was wrong. Or to come up to our kids at some point and say, you know what, I, I really wasn't listening. You were trying to tell me something, and I didn't think it was very important because I'm trying to get the big scheme and big picture of everything, and I really wasn't listening to you, and I want to tell you something I was wrong for kind of blowing you off. Or son, daughter, I I didn't lead our family well in this situation. And my inactivity, my kind of checking out of the situation made everything worse for everybody. And I want you to know, I need to take responsibility for that. That's, That's on me. Man, what would happen if our kids start to hear us just honestly confess our sins I wonder when this story, when you talk about the Passover, how the story would be told when God says, when your kids ask why you do this, tell them. I think it could go one of two ways. You could have someone, an Israelite parent, say, okay, son, daughter, I'll tell you why we do this. 
We do this Passover meal because we were a people enslaved in Egypt, and the Egyptians were horrible. They beat us, they enslaved us, they actually tried to commit genocide against us by taking our newborns and tossing them into the Nile River. These were evil people. And God, who is a righteous and just God, saw it all, and he saw our misery, and God in his goodness came down, and he wanted to rescue us, and he brought plagues against them in judgment. And finally, on this night, he brought the plague of the killing of the firstborn son. And the firstborn son means the hopes of the whole family, the responsibility of the whole family, and God was holding them responsible. And on that night, God got the bad guys, and he saved us the good guys. I could see that story being told, but I could also see an honest parent who says to his child, I'll tell you why this happened. They were evil. They did horrible things to us. They wanted to wipe us out. And on that night, God brought judgment. But did you notice, son? Did you notice, daughter, that we had to kill our very best lamb? An innocent lamb had nothing to do with this, but we had to slaughter that lamb. And we had to take the blood of that lamb and put it over our doorposts. And that it actually tells us, God tells us that he spared us. Why would he have to spare us if we were the good guys? He spared us because, I got to tell you, son, daughter, we deserve death too because we're sinners. You deserve death? You're saying that you're a sinner like the Egyptians are sinners? I'm not trying to minimize what they did. I'm trying to say that I am a sinner and I deserve death. And God in his mercy gave us a way to be saved. He said, if you put the blood up, but notice, son and daughter, did you know that we couldn't leave the house after we did that? Wouldn't it have been a great sign for us to walk out among the streets while the angel of death is killing all the bad guys and to say, look, we're safe. But God says, you're only safe if you're under the blood. And to say, we have to stay in this house. We're saved by grace and mercy, not because we are the good guys, but because God is a God who's gracious and willing to cover our sin if we stop trying to make ourselves look good and trust in his righteousness and tell them that story. Then suddenly... Children begin to see, oh, this isn't about bad guys, good guys. This is about we're all sinners. And mom and dad, too. So this, what this means to you is what? I needed the lamb. In fact, let me tell you a story, son or daughter. Let me tell you a story about the lamb. Because our goal as a parent is then what? To point them to the true lamb of God. To say, this is not just a bunch of stories from a long time ago. This is about the living God now. And I want to tell you a story I'm glad you keep asking why. Here's the story about the lamb. That lamb goes back a long way. Did you know when Adam and Eve first died, or first committed a sin, and they were told they were going to have to die, and yet they tried to cover themselves in fig leaves, but God actually gave them animal coverings, which means an animal had to die in their place, a substitute. That animal's blood for theirs. Did you know that later on, there was a guy named Abraham who had a son whom he loved. And God told him to take his son up to the mountain that he would show him. And by the way, son, we celebrate this Passover in Jerusalem, but guess where that mountain was that Abraham took his son? It's where Jerusalem would end up being. And he told us, sacrifice your son. And on the way up, he gave his son the wood to carry for the sacrifice while Abraham carried the knife And all the way up, the son kept asking, but where's the animal for the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide. And when they got up there, instead of sacrificing his son, God provided a ram that was caught in the thicket, and that ram became the substitute death for him. And more than that, hundreds of years later, there was a prophet named Isaiah who said, and we're all like sheep, like lambs who've gone astray. But as Gary read earlier, but now there's come someone, the suffering servant, who takes on our sin and punishment. And then even later, there's a man named John. When he saw Jesus, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Mom, Dad, why do we have to go to church? Do we have to go to church? Why do we go to church? You could give the quick answer. Hey, Google this. It's Sunday. That's why we go. We go to church because it's Sunday. Quit asking. You know we always go. Just get in the car. We're going to church. Or you could say, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about that because it means something to me. And that story is this true Lamb of God. He died for me. We go because we have a good, good father. And he did like Abraham. He walked his son up a hill. He made his son carry the wooden cross. And when that angel, when Abraham went to sacrifice his son, but he, he didn't at the end because God said, no, don't do it, I've provided for you. And the angel said, well, now I know that you love God. Why? Because you didn't even spare your only son. You were willing to sacrifice your only son. Now we get to tell God, our Heavenly Father, that very thing. Oh, we know. No. I know. I know that you love me because you did not spare your only son. Son, daughter, we don't have to go to church. We get to go to church. Son, daughter, we don't have to serve. We don't have to try to impress God or earn something from Him. We get to serve because He loved us first. And this is personal. And I needed His sacrifice. I'm lost without it. And to hear our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents telling our children, I'm a sinner. And without that sacrifice, I'm lost. But I'll tell you, when you receive it, it changes everything from the inside out. And son, daughter, that's all we've ever prayed for you, is that you would come to know the true Lamb of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, God, that you're working this uh, love in us. And it does really free us up, God. The more we receive of you, the more open we can be about our sins and we can confess our sins to one another, something that seemed impossible um, before uh, your love came to us. And so, God, we pray that you keep working that among us as a church, that we're able to confess and admit our sins, knowing that when we're in an atmosphere of grace, that it's okay, that we won't be rejected, that we won't be put down, but that others will also say, yeah, that's me too, that I also am a sinner saved by grace. And then together, God, that we get to serve you. We get to love you because you loved us first. And so, God, work that among us. Make that real. Help us to pass that on to our children, to the next generation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep worshiping. You don't have to sing this last song. You get to sing this last song. So if you know that kind of love in your heart, I pray you would worship God with this closing song. If you have in your heart a stirring, because you feel like God's speaking to you, we want to pray with you. We'll be available at the doors. While people are singing, just come out, visit with us. We'd love to pray. Let's stand. Let's worship together today.